Coming up on this edition of Out of the Blue. When it comes to national competition, MTSU students not only compete, they strive for excellence and take home top honors. Meet apparel design national winner Alicia Gillespie. Spring has arrived and so has baseball. For MTSU, it's a new head coach and a new year filled with optimism. And in this month's cover story, they ventured out to Hollywood in the 1930s to create the American Dream Machine. But directors like George Cukor were, as Professor Elise Helford contends, ambivalent about their ethnicity and their sexuality. See more in A Double Life and Sylvia Scarlet. Plus highlights of MTSU's success on the hard court, all ahead on this month's edition of Out of the Blue. Hello and welcome to another edition of Out of the Blue. I'm Mike Browning. We're coming to you this month from the newly renovated Learning Resources Center, where design majors hone their craft. An MTSU apparel design major recently took home top honors in the National Outdoor Clothing Design Contest in Salt Lake City. Her backcountry ski jacket impressed judges for its quality and unique hooded design. The MTSU student's passion for apparel began in middle school. When Alicia Gillespie was just 12 years old, she threaded her mom's sewing machine with no problem. So at 12 years old, I got my first machine. She taught herself how to make prom dresses and took an interest in sculpture. I think that is what helped lead me into doing design and a, a, especially apparel because it's like a human, it's like a sculpture on a human. She was top of her high school class in sewing. It was at that point that I realized I really had a talent or a skill. Gillespie entered MTSU in apparel design within the textile, merchandising, and design major. Recently, Project OR, Outdoor Retailing, contacted five universities, including MTSU, looking for talent. They chose me over all the other students. Gillespie and four other national top competitors were limited to 48 hours to create a backcountry ski jacket. And only the vendors and the people who created the brief know what the brief is until 10 a.m. on day one. After we get the brief, we're given time to uh, about three hours to come up with a concept and do a preliminary sketch and come up with an idea, which is no time at all to even figure out what you're doing, especially if you've never skied before. All the competitors worked from the exact same brief in the same room. Well, to start out with, the challenge was figuring out what I was making, because the brief actually says, a convertible women's backcountry ski slash snow jacket with an ear covering accessory. So I had to read it about six times to break it down and I also had to include the ear covering accessory, some sort of hat or headband or something and so that was probably the first challenge. The next challenge was figuring out what she could do in the 48 hour time frame without sleep no doubt. I chose to do just enough design elements that I thought I would have time to completely complete, to, to, to sew and finish all the way until it was done. There's nothing more you can do with it. And Even though it wasn't required, she also made it finished on the inside. And I think that's really what made a difference for me was being able to sew it and construct it really well. The double hood feature enables the skier to fit the larger outer shell hood over a helmet. Did do, I made a hood that was separate from the collar but still attached to the jacket so the collar could be pulled up around the face without having the hood on and then the hood would come up and over the helmet Then it would have a bungee cord system inside it where you pull the bungee and it tightens down on the helmet. Her design was unique because rather than a bungee system in the back and over the head she added a unique touch. I tried to incorporate it by going up from one side, across the back, up over the head, across the back again, and then down the other side. So you pull here, and it pulls down, back, and down all at once. The rather complex design did the trick, despite some initial reservations on the part of judges. Something along the lines of, uh, we weren't sure how she was going to do because during her first presentation, there was a lot of grief from us. We didn't really see where she was going and didn't think she had the potential, but once we saw her garment, we saw the competition had really 
been bumped up and so congratulations Alicia and I about cried <laughs> but, but I was shocked I could have sworn that the girl who made runner-up won all I could do was like hold my composure so that I didn't cry on camera <laughs> The next accolade for MTSU apparel design major Alicia Gillespie. She's featured in a national outdoor magazine, Textile Insight, this month. Just another Blue Raider success story. And more success for MTSU alumni at the 2013 Grammys. MTSU alumnus Josh Keir took home his third Country Song of the Year honor, winning recognition for Carrie Underwood's Blown Away to add to earlier wins for Lady Annabellum's Need You Now and Underwood's Before He Cheats. Keir is a 1996 history graduate of MTSU. 2003 recording industry grad Terrance Esmond earned a producer's Grammy for Best Gospel Album for his work on hip-hop artist Lecrae's 2012 release, Gravity, which also won Rap Hip-Hop Album of the Year at the 2012 Dove Awards. And MTSU alumnus Luke Laird co-wrote the single Pontoon for Little Big Town, which won this year's Country Duo Group Performance Grammy. Laird, who co-wrote other nominated songs this year, is a 2001 recording industry graduate. This is a group of proud MTSU students, MTSU's six-member construction management team that placed eighth in the nation in the International Builders Show in Las Vegas. The competition gives students the opportunity to apply what they've learned in the classroom to a real construction project proposal. This year, 118 acres to develop on the banks of the Utah Lake in Saratoga Springs, Utah. Congratulations. MTSU continues to spur girls in science, holding another Girls Raised in Tennessee Science or GRITS conference on campus in February. The young women learned about planning Expanding Your Horizons conferences and on why role models matter from an organization called TechBridge. I got offered a scholarship in high school to work for academic service hours and I picked the chemistry department to work for and thankfully I got paired up with Dr. Gross to work. I am the director of our Women in STEM Center. We have several programs which support girls in STEM, science, technology, engineering and mathematics and one of those programs is GRITS, meaning Girls Raised in Tennessee Science. And Expanding Horizons in Math and Science is a hands-on conference for girls in STEM where they learn that they can do STEM and they also meet professional women role models. So TechBridge is all about introducing middle school and high school girls to basic engineering concepts, exposing them to role models. We don't have a lot of programs for girls, particularly in science in East Tennessee. I love what's going on here and we'd like to duplicate some of that up in East Tennessee. Through Judith, I was able to start the ball rolling at my school with a STEM program and I've also taken that to collaborate with other teachers and schools in my community. I attended my first EYH this past fall and I really realized how incredible it was and how many girls did not know beforehand that they would like to be in a science career. It's kind of a really good um, support system for girls who are learning like what they really want to do with their life. We want more in the South because we see that the girls who attend EYH are becoming STEM majors in college and are becoming STEM professionals. For nearly two decades, MTSU chemistry professor Dr. Judith Iriarte Gross has promoted science as a career possibility for girls and young women. Recently, MTSU President Dr. Sidney A. McPhee awarded her with the President's Silver Column Award for her hard work and commitment to young women and the university. Well, the MTSU 2013 baseball season officially got underway February 15th. Every year, the Blue Raiders baseball team hosts its annual Groundhog Day luncheon as a public fundraiser and a preview of the upcoming season. Well, this year was the 40th annual. Although a familiar face to MTSU fans, the Blue Raiders baseball team has a new head coach. You know, a, a, a little bit about the team while they're up standing up here. We, uh, we're, we're an older team, an older group. We've got 14 seniors, eight juniors. So on a 35-man roster, that's, that's a very old team in college baseball. So it's their time, and, and they know it is. I mean, we've, we've made progress over the last couple of years to start to move forward to be able to compete for a championship. And I think this team can do that. You know, we've got, we've got some very, very good returning players, you know, headed up by, you know, Jonathan Freebus, who you just met a minute ago, freshman All-American, freshman of the year in our conference. 
you know, was one of our top pitchers last year. Hunter Atkins was drafted in the 18th round last year by the Milwaukee Brewers, but turned it down to come back to school. Fortunate, you know, to have those two arms back. And then offensively with, with Hank LaRue, you know, an all-conference player his freshman and sophomore year. He's coming off of an injury, but, but has a chance to be in the lineup for us, you know, on opening day, maybe not in the field, but we'll be out there and be a big part of it. Uh, Trent Miller, who did the prayer at the beginning of it, uh, a beginning of all this. Trent hit 13 home runs last year, was second in the conference in home runs, and, and was an all-region player, and, and counting on him to be in the middle of the lineup for us. And then our two middle infielders, Johnny Thomas and Ryan Ford, you know, both seniors that are going to be back, that are going to solidify the middle of the infield. So. And here's some recent highlights worth seeing again. Here's the 1-0 pitch. High ball deep into right. Back is Gilligan. He'll run out of room. It's a home run. And Middle Tennessee goes up 2-1. to one. The stretch and the pitch. Swing and a looper to the shortstop. He's there. Middle Tennessee State wins. Middle Tennessee State beats Auburn by a score of 2-1. to one. The Blue Raiders baseball team got off to a 6-2 and two start in February, so get out and enjoy some sunshine while supporting your Blue Raiders. MTSU will join Conference USA in July. Conference Commissioner Britton Banowski paid a friendly visit to Middle Tennessee last month, touting MTSU as a fine addition to the expanded conference. We were all about um, trying to identify the next generation of great programs and great universities. Uh, one that have ones that have wonderful upside uh, potential, large schools, large markets, and as I said, Middle Tennessee is a, a great uh, fit. QCOR is very much into that. He always said, I don't want to be a hyphenated American. I just want to be an American. And you can see that that's about being of the privileged class, race, gender. I wanted to be like I didn't want to talk about being Jewish, didn't want to talk about being gay. I am True Blue. As a member of this diverse community, I am a valuable contributor to its progress and success. I am engaged in the life of this community. I am a recipient and a giver. I am a listener and a speaker. I am honest in word and deed. I am committed to reason, not violence. I am a learner now and forever. I am a Blue Raider. I am a Blue Raider. I'm a Blue Raider. True Blue. Being True Blue is helping others to reach their potential. My name is Daryl Freeman, and I am True Blue. This is not just a recording studio. This is not just a flight school. This is not just a university. This is MTSU, home of Tennessee's best. Being True Blue is working to enhance our community. My name is Kobe Sherlock, and I am True Blue. George Cukor is one of the most respected film directors in Hollywood history. His hits include Little Women, The Philadelphia Story, and My Fair Lady. But there were subtext in many of his films that fans might not have detected. MTSU English professor Dr. Elise Helford has researched Jewish ambivalence in the 1947 Cukor directed film A Double Life and female drag in three other Cukor movies, including 1935's Sylvia Scarlet. Dr. Helford recently sat down for an interview on MTSU's On the Record with Jenna Loeb to talk about her insights. Hollywood director George Cukor was Jewish and gay, but at the time, 1930s through the 1960s, MTSU professor Dr. Elise Helford says no one talked openly about his homosexuality. 
Right. You have that combination of a Hollywood system that included a less invasive media, a less invasive paparazzi. Uh, you didn't get people storming your doors and asking questions and talking to your ex-lovers and things like that. And so for Cukor, um, he was able to keep the persona he wanted uh, to a certain extent. The fact that people called him a women's director uh, was seen by some as a slight or as a indirect reference to his homosexuality. Helford teaches courses in film studies criticism and gender studies. Her essays focus on what she calls Jewish ambivalence. And in fact, there was one point in which she said, I'd rather have been a ladies' man than a woman's director. Most called him an actor's director. He worked hard to get the best out of actors, especially female stars like Katherine Hepburn, Joan Crawford, Marilyn Monroe, and Audrey Hepburn. Also men like Cary Grant and Jimmy Stewart. He was easy to work with, and he cared about the actors and the actors' perspective. He said, I'm not a writer, I'm not messing with the script. I'm not a cinematographer. He would hire the best people he could and say, you set up your camera the way you think you'll get the best shot. Helford's thesis focuses on the cultural anxieties for Jewish Americans of the age. They come out to Hollywood, they create this American dream machine, but very few of the films are about Jews, particularly early on and very few uh, are directed by Jews, particularly pre-World War II. Far from orthodox or even practicing Jews, Helford says they wanted to fit in. Cukor is very much into that. He always said, I don't want to be a hyphenated American. I just want to be an American. And you can see that that's about being of the privileged class, race, gender. He wanted to be a white guy. Didn't want to talk about being Jewish. Didn't want to talk about being gay. In Cukor's 1947 thriller film, A Double Life, British actor Ronald Coleman plays an Othello-like character who murdered his wife on stage and becomes a murderer in real life. This film wins uh, awards. Cukor doesn't as a director, but the film wins awards. Ronald Coleman wins the Academy Award for Best Actor, and the film that wins the Best Film of the Year is Gentleman's Agreement with Gregory Peck that is a film not directed by a Jew, the original screenplay is by a Jewish American, but it's about anti-Semitism in America. Right. And so here's George Cukor, I think I'll make this thriller about this guy who was playing Othello and he goes nuts and becomes Othello and murders a woman. The other aspect of Jewishness that interested me is in order to get Coleman riled up so that he would be really, really ready to play this role, Cukor took him aside in his trailer and told him stories about his own unhappiness and struggles and pain he went through as a young man in New York, as a Jewish young man. Evidently, Kukor thought Coleman had never suffered in his life. So lots of little things that come together to say there is some interesting material here on Jewishness that's going on. In A Double Life, Helford argues in her essays, Kukor continues to bring up anxieties. Helford sees Kukor not so much self-loathing as self-directed, wanting to pull himself up by his own bootstraps, determined to fulfill his own destiny. It's partly about Cukor, but it's also about the era, and it's about messages that are being spoken and not spoken. Conventional thought is that Cukor desired to make great films. Helford suggests he doesn't so much make great films as great moments in films. Shelley Winters, who was Jewish, starred in A Double Life, playing a working class character. She worried about what it might do to her career. But Cukor kept saying to her, I want it to be clear that she is doomed and going to die from the minute you see her. He made her film her you opening scene over 100 right. times. So if you think about self-hating Jews, and Shelley Winters was Jewish, I, I have to question that 100 times doing the scene until she I'll is be, worn uh, down. Um, worries me in terms of class issues, mm -hmm. in terms of the character that she's playing, and that's who uh, Ronald Coleman's going to kill. I like you, you know. Now I do. Helford says her goal is to provide deeper understanding of the individual's culture and ideas being mobilized in the era. What constellation of features are coming together in this film uh, and how can I talk about them in interesting ways other than he's an actor's director, he directed a lot of women. Helford has written articles on three other Kukor films, including the 1935 film Sylvia Scarlet, starring Katherine Hepburn. In Scarlet, Hepburn spends most of the movie wearing men's clothing. It was neither a box office nor critical success. In one article published in Feminist Media Studies, Helford explores ambiguous sexuality in the 1935 film. Sylvia Scarlet was a flop, and Cukor himself said, well, I better not be so daring in future. 
A couple of scenes were cut from the film out of concern for what should and should not be shown, a sort of gentleman's code before the 1940s age of the Hayes Code restrictions. There's no question in my mind that you know Katherine Hepburn as a woman from the minute you see the film, in part because her name is on the screen. Uh, and people, she had been in uh, a couple of films before this, and so people knew her. Um, but the film is incredibly playful. Enjoy yourself, that's my motto. You're only young once, I always say. And the gender bending, Helford says, is ahead of its time. But there's a scene where Cary Grant, now thinking that Katherine Hepburn's character, oh, Sylvester Scarlet, is a man, a young man, teenager, says, let's bunk together, you'll be a proper little hot water bottle. Hey, you'll make a proper little hot water bottle. No. And there's implications of no problems with intimacy and sleeping together with a man. It's not saying they're going to have sex, but um, it's suggesting that that kind of intimacy isn't a problem. In one kiss scene, a woman traveling with a theatrical group, a maid named Maudie, kisses Hepburn's character. And Katherine Hepburn enjoys it. Oh yes, don't I look lovely with this mustache, I'm so classy. And then she kisses Katherine Hepburn. And so you have a female character kissing a female character in drag who, whom she thinks is male. You can't call it lesbian because she thinks Katherine Hepburn's character is male. Right. But it's two women kissing on the screen. And then you have this terrible cut in the middle of the scene where Ka then Catherine Hepburn pushes the character away because Catherine Hepburn is heterosexual in the film. Helford sees the film not only performing gender in Hepburn's character, but also in other characters who band together to form an acting troupe of pink clowns in what Helford sees as gender-bending costumes. There's that multiple level of having a film that's about theatricality, directed by a director who's invested in the theater. A poem I'll recite to you. Just anyone you choose. The actors and actors, director invested in acting, and then you get that layer of drag and performativity over it. Helford sees gender not so much as biology, but as performance. So you get up every morning and you decide what your gender means to you that day and how you want to manifest it. But we must perform by the sea. Uh... Dr. Helford understands not everyone will agree with her deep reading thesis of Q-Core films, nor perhaps her view on gender, but she welcomes the criticism. After all, that is what she does when she studies gender in film. We'll be right back. We started in 1911 with a clear mission to train Tennessee's best teachers. For the last 100 years, Middle Tennessee State University has carried out that mission and so much more nationally recognized as an affordable quality university, the number one choice of undergraduates in Tennessee. As we celebrate our centennial, we look with pride at the past. We look forward to the future. Check out why we're Tennessee's best. Being True Blue is giving your all on and off the court. My name is Ebony Rowe and I am True Blue. Being True Blue is embracing unique perspectives. My name is Iris Montes and I am True Blue. Being True Blue is helping students solve real world problems. My name is Cliff Ricketts and I am True Blue. Being True Blue is making the world a safer place. My name is Sam Willie, and I am True Blue.
The Blue Raiders men's basketball team earned another conference championship and a number one seed in the Sunbelt Conference Tournament scheduled to take place in Hot Springs, Arkansas, March 8th through the 11th. Sean Jones blocked a number of shots as MTSU earned the number one seed with an 85-50 victory over South Alabama. At the time, a 13th straight win for the Blue Raiders. In the 35-point win, five Blue Raiders scored in double figures as MTSU continues to display a balanced attack. MTSU closed out its home schedule in the Murphy Center with a perfect 16-0 record, dominating Louisiana Monroe 87-46. Tweedy Knight led all scorers with 15 points. On February 16th, head basketball coach Kermit Davis became the Sun Belt's all-time winningest coach as MTSU defeated UALR 66-61 in Little Rock. MTSU's 52-point win over Troy, 94-41, became the largest margin of victory in Sun Belt history for the Blue Raiders. In the game, Raymond Centron was on fire, notching a career-high six three-pointers. Head coach Kermit Davis on becoming the Sun Belt's all-time winningest coach. So it's just it's quite an honor to be, you know, number one to to stay at a great place like Middle Tennessee for 11 years and uh, and be mentioned with a lot of really good coaches in the Sun Belt. A narrow MTSU victory on the road against Florida International is worth seeing again. With less than a second remaining and the game tied, here's what happened next. It'll go toward the rim. Sean Jones puts it up and scores. Sean Jones. The Lady Raiders closed out the home schedule with a win over Louisiana Monroe, pushing MTSU Sun Belt record this season to 15 and 3, 20 and 7 overall. Courtney Jones had an amazing night, scoring 30 points in the Lady Raiders 74 to 53 win over ULM as the MTSU women's basketball team reached the 20 win mark for the ninth straight year. After suffering a couple of losses on the road, All-American candidate Ebony Rowe helped the Lady Raiders get back in the win column by defeating South Alabama 69-48 to at the Murphy Center. Rowe scored 18 points and grabbed 11 rebounds for her 47th double-double of her career. Courtney Jones scored a new season-high 32 points in the Lady Raiders' 93-49 to dominating victory over Arkansas State. It was the third 30-plus performance by an MTSU player this season. The new recruiting class for MTSU football is something to cheer about. Head coach Rick Stockstill is especially excited about a young new quarterback. I'm excited about our offensive side of the ball. I think we've got a really good quarterback in A.J. I think, uh, you know, he, he's going to be a guy that um, is going to be a really good player for us here. He's, he's got the ability to extend plays with his feet. Uh, but he's also an excellent passer. He came to our camp a couple times this summer. So I'm really excited about A.J. and the character uh, that he brings to this football team. A.J. Erdely is a 6'3", 205-pound quarterback from West Forsyth, Georgia. Erdely is touted as a strong, athletic, and highly competitive dual-threat quarterback. The 2013 football season gets underway August 29th against Western Carolina. The home schedule features games with Memphis, East Carolina, Marshall, Florida International, and UTEP as MTSU begins play in Conference USA. For more information on MTSU News, be sure to go to mtsunews.com. That's it for this edition of Out of the Blue. Until next time, stay true blue.